1982, director Ridley Scott introduced sci-fi to film noir to create his cult masterpiece, Blade Runner. He modernized the genre by subverting typical tropes associated with the male protagonist, femme fatale, and plot while honoring the prior conventions of the genre. This video essay will focus on the final cut version of the film, and will start by defining film noir and its tropes. Film noir has its roots in 1940s and 50s movies that dealt with the aftermath following World War II. Men were returning to an unfamiliar home where women had entered a new dominant place in the workforce which resulted in new anxieties. Films appropriated this into popular culture, which resulted in broken, cynical men, and strong, sexually charged women with plots that typically focused on a detective diving into the criminal underbelly of society. These films also prominently feature chiaroscuro and chronotype stylistically. Chiaroscuro is a lighting style that focuses on the contrast of light and dark. Chronotopes are the association of a location relative to its time and space. An example of this could be the sentiment someone feels about a gas station while they're on a road trip, and those same feelings when they're seeing a gas station in a movie. Film noir switched familiar chronotypes for those that reflected transitional areas of the time. These are referred to as lounge time by Vivian Sobchak and contain spaces such as bars, and nightclubs, and cocktail lounges. As a genre, sci-fi is focused on futuristic settings and usually explores the relationship between technology and science on people and society, for better or worse. It raises existential questions such as humanity's dependence on technology, the ethics of how it is used, and how it can help or hinder society. Blade Runner imbues sci-fi into its mossy insane, chronotopes, and existential themes. There are updated sci-fi versions of dimly lit, rainy streets, and smoky interiors. The chronotopes follow similarly, featuring futuristic lonely apartments, clubs, and locales. The world of Blade Runner feels real, but unwelcoming and nihilistic. Technology and society are seamless, but at odds. Humans have created replicants as identical copies, but do not view them as humans. When they become too human, they are seen as threats. Blade Runner asks what it means to be human, specifically if humanity is only in those who are naturally born, or if technology that is perfectly identical to humans can be even more human. Blade Runner follows the story of Rick Deckard, a retired Blade Runner who was brought back into the game to hunt down four replicants, synthetic androids who return to Earth in search of their creators. Blade Runners are policemen assigned to hunt down rogue replicants who start to exude human emotions and question their existence beyond free labor. He is the grandson of noir types like Walter Neff and Jim Rorden. He's a cynical detective who keeps to himself, choosing to bury his emotions with drinks and his work. The replicant's leader is Roy Batty, who is a philosophical android that is traditionally out of place in film noir. Instead of presenting himself cynically, he pursues more life and meaning beyond his original designation as a modified soldier. He views the women amongst them as equal peers and seeks freedom from the replicant system. The women of the film go against typical noir as well. Traditional femme fatales are empowered women who are typically punished at the end of the film for taking their own personal agency, which was reflected in men's sentiments in the 1940s and 50s. They tempt the men around them into crime for their own prestige and personal gain. The film takes two approaches to this. The replicants Pris and Zora are treated as equals by Batty, and entice men such as Sebastian to help their criminal agendas. However, they're pursuing the same thing as Batty, which is freedom and more life instead of power and prestige. They are still punished and killed by Deckard, but only after they cause him to struggle in his pursuit and question as to whether or not he's justified in killing them. The film's central femme fatale, Rachel, does not pursue her own agenda, but is instead naive and only acts criminally when provoked into acting by the men around her. Her appearance pays homage to noir figures such as Joan Crawford and the Mildred Pierce. She does not seek power or crime, but instead a deeper understanding on who she is, regardless of her standing as a replicant. Blade Runner's ending results in a literal fight that is symbolic of old noir meeting new noir. Scott pays homage to prior noir films such as Double Indemnity by choosing to film in the Bradbury Building. He modernizes the building, taking its interior and having Deckard and Batty's confrontation play out in dimly lit, gray scenes with rain pouring in the background. After killing the rest of the replicants, Deckard ultimately ends up losing to Batty and nearly falls to his death. Instead of letting Deckard die, Batty tells him the following. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the Ten Houser Gate. All those moments will be lost in time. Like <clears throat> tears.
Fatty's monologue tells Deckard about the significance of his own existence in a universe that does not care. Despite not being human, Batty has seen and done things far more significant than most humans could ever experience or understand in their own far longer lifetimes. He understands the cyclical nature of consciousness and a universe that will ultimately forget about those experiences ever existing. His quest for new life fails, but he dies content knowing that he was more human than even the man whose purpose is to kill him. Blade Runner subverts traditional noir endings by leaving the central protagonist with a new, less cynical perspective as he goes off with Rachel. Each character is liberated from their past and free to go forth on their own whim. Deckard learns from Batty. He will no longer allow himself to be subjected to society's role for him and chooses his own agency. Rachel goes along with him in an ending that somewhat fits the femme fatale's role. Her existence is still punished, as her and Deckard are on the run, but she is allowed the opportunity to escape and live on her own terms. 